Brew. <laughs> yes, go with me on this. With this brew. So, uh, at some point, later tonight, we will do the most spectacular thing that we possibly can with the brew. Um, for now, the room can wait over there. Um, just a couple of things. For those people who haven't uh, met me or had, uh, you know, had uh, feel free to come back after the show and talk to me in the bar. But uh, usually as a day job, I work for CSIRO Education. I'll just point out something here that tonight I do not have my CSIRO hat on. Um, I'm firmly, completely hatless tonight, <laughs> except for maybe a nice fez or something like that. Um, but tonight, nothing to do with the CSIRO. Also, too, I'll just point out that uh, I'm, I'm a dad, too. He's in the audience. Uh, somewhere there. Oh, there he is. Hello. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Here, you can see him. here he is here as well, too. <laughs> there we go. That's a little self portrait. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, Gabriel's in the audience. And, um, yeah, that's it. Okay, now, for the rest of you. Tonight, it is an evening of rough science, and what we're going to be doing tonight is looking at three main areas, three main um, uh, topics of science, and um, things that hopefully you guys can try out yourself at home as well too. Uh, so tonight, we're going to be dissecting a microwave. We're going to be uh, unraveling the rainbow and painting the sky, and finally we're going to try and <laughs> explain climate change to your dad. Hi, Dad. I know you're there. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, those three things, let's make a start. Act one. We're doing an autopsy on a microwave. Um, once upon a time, there was a man named Percy. Um, nice guy. A little awkward as a teenager. Uh, but as he grew up, he then became an engineer. And um, he, he was actually quite um, a, a bit of a tinker at home, a home inventor and that sort of stuff. Um, now, one day, um, not long after World War II, so this is about 1947, if you imagine the bombs being dropped on Hiroshima, uh, sorry, Hiroshima, um, that uh, the world is in a, this post war joy but also economic malaise. And he is in a laboratory, and he walks by a transmitter. Now, Percy really liked chocolate, and inside his pocket, top pocket here, he had a chocolate bar. He had what was called a Mr. Good, Mr. Mr. Good bar bar. It, it was a very popular. <laughs> I know. I, I, look, it's American. Ask them. Okay? And he walked past this transmitter, did, spent some time in front of it, and then walked away and noticed that his Mr. Good bar bar um, was was now melted. The transmitter that he stood in front of was a microwave transmitter, and they were experimenting with at the time the use of microwaves as a way of sending signals around the place, around the earth, and, and using it for uh, telecommunication. In fact, it's still used in telecommunication today. In fact, just to digress, uh, let's fast forward a few years. It's now 1998. Te microwaves are being used everywhere for telecommunication, and in particular in Canada, uh, Mr. Edwin Baker discovered <laughs> just how warm microwaves could get. Um, Mr. Edwin Baker wor worked at a telephone relay company as a night watchman, and what he did was that uh, at night he explained to people afterwards that uh, he found that as he walked around this um, telephone uh, company place, they had a transmitter up on the roof. It was a microwave transmitter, and on those cold nights, you know, this is Canada, he would find that up there would be nice and warm, right <laughs> next to this transmitter. <laughs> and um, he was actually severely disciplined because to, you're not allowed to walk in front of this transmitter. In fact, alarms went off when he tried walking in front of this uh, transmitter, so he actually deactivated the alarms. <laughs> <laughs> Found, you know, standing in front of this transmitter, quite nice, um, and nice and warm, and uh, then we carry on. He was discovered this, and he was docked uh, a week's pay and suspended for a little while, and then he was given the Christmas shift. Um, Edwin Baker went and bought himself a plastic lawn chair and a 12-pack of beer, and over the Christmas shift, he set himself up in front of the transmitter. Now, when John Burns, the day watchman, came in to find him the next day, uh, he thought that Edwin uh, had actually uh, made a roast for him. He could smell it coming in. Uh, mm. You see, this is the thing. Microwaves, <laughs> <laughs> microwaves have this amazing ability to be able to uh, excite 
water molecules. And uh, the microwaves come out, they hit the water molecules. Water molecules have this particular shape. You imagine H2O, two hydrogens and oxygen. It hits it, they kind of oscillate and move around. It's a bit of kinetic energy. Yeah, it looks just like that. <laughs> Lailing on. Um, and they'll bump into other things around it. So it's very good at heating up things like water. Now, we're going to get into that thing in just a moment. We're going to pull it apart. We're going to find the microtransmitter. And I implore you, everybody here, to try this out yourself. Because there are some amazing things. If you pull apart a microwave and get into the guts of it, uh, there are some fantastic things you can actually pull out and play with, separate to the microwave itself. So we'll come to that in a moment. But let's rewind a bit. Back to Percy. Because Percy has noticed his good guy bar. Good bar. Good Mr. Good bar. He noticed his chocolate bar was melted. And he, he then started to put two and two together, realised these microwaves could do something. These microwaves could heat things up. And he, he thought about, well, what if he could actually take that idea and then wrap it in some kind of case and slap a warranty on it? Um, <laughs> maybe he could make something that could actually go out there and, and, and uh, cook stuff. And he, he, his first attempt at cooking something, he cooked popcorn. He put popcorn in there and it worked. The popcorn, you know, it got excited, it popped, it worked. Uh, the second thing that he tried was an egg. <laughs> yeah. One of the experimenters ended up with the egg exploding on him and scalding him terribly. So the very, very oh yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's shining for it. The, um, the egg, uh, that egg incident is actually the first recorded incident of somebody actually being injured by a microwave. Uh, so, let's get into this thing here. Uh, microwaves, uh, if you ever want to pick up your own microwave to have a go trying to pull it apart, I recommend Hard Rubbish Collection. This one here just came from a Hard Rubbish Collection. A couple of things though, and this is serious safety stuff. The power cord that comes out the back, cut it off, find a plastic bag, put it in the plastic bag, tie it off and throw it out. Make sure nobody gets that power cord. If somebody plugs that thing in with wires exposed, we're looking at instant death. So make sure that that thing's removed and put out of harm's way. The rest of the microwave uh, is relatively safe, but we'll get to it. <laughs> um, okay, so, oh, just incidentally, when I was a kid, uh, I had a friend down the street whose father told him that, base, uh, that inside a microwave, um, because it was back in the 80s, and it was in the days of when microwaves didn't have quite so much electronic gear on the front and just had uh, you know, a little bell inside it. He told his son that the microwave had a little man inside it. Teeny tiny little man. And this little man sat on a little stool and his sole job was basically every time that the food was ready, he had a teeny tiny triangle. <laughs> and it would go ding. Now, um, it just so happened that by and by, a little while later, the, uh, the, the uh, bell stopped working in their particular microwave and they had to go and get it fixed. But, you know, this guy's dad, not wanting to be uh, up by, you know, a, a broken microwave, actually said to his son, oh yeah, it's because we've got to pay the little man inside the microwave. <laughs> so the microwave came back, it was fixed, but then got severely broken a couple of months later. And uh, so they took it to uh, repair it again. And they found that in the... One of the vets, um, when they take it apart, there was five dollars and fifty-five cents. This boy was so concerned about the little man inside there, he was actually putting in his own uh, pocket money to make it. Okay. That's now, a couple of things. Microwave is incredibly heavy, but also there is something in here uh, called a uh, high voltage. So if you ever pull apart one of these, uh, one of the things you'll need to do is discharge that thing. Now, all of this stuff I'm talking about now, you may not be able to remember it, that's fine. Go and check out my website, I'll have pictures, you can see how to do all this. So, well... Ha, 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 ha. 
a version of this child's voice. It's just a prison. Glass prison, like that. Incidentally, this one came from Vandekamp, which is a wonderful shop just in the city. Be sure to check that out. <laughs> uh, now, what I'm going to get Paul over here to do is we need something for this, um, uh, for this projection to fall on. So, so Paul, if you can stand there for a moment, and I'm going to give you this piece of card, and if you can hold it up, basically, that way around there like that. Now, uh, I'm going to be uh, moving around to actually get this into the right spot, but uh, the most important thing we need here is a very good light source and to hit you with a broom. <laughs> Seven 
unique differentiated colors is it's, it's not exactly wrong exactly, but it's sort of thinking about our eyes uh, sort of pick up and distinguish all of these colors. We break it down because of the way we interpret in our eyes and in our brain. But the way the light is working is that the light brown over on this end over here has really very large wavelengths, whereas the white over at this end has very small wavelengths, and everywhere in between they're going from big to small. It's just that our eyes pick it up and interpret it like this. This is how we perceive the world. So to actually say that there are seven colours is, is perhaps not a, a correct way of thinking about it. Anyway, I'm showing you all of this because this is called the spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum for, for visible light. And it has a lot to do with how we go about thinking about how the sky goes blue. And I love the explanation for how the sky goes blue. And uh, it's, it's one of my favourite sort of um, uh, science moments. And to do it, you can actually do it yourself. You can um, get yourself a container of water of some sort. So over here I've got a, a big fish tank of water. And what we're going to do to this fish tank of water is we're going to pass a light through. So I have this light at the back. Now, it is very bright. I'm a bit reluctant to shine it directly at you. So it will be at some point pointing in this direction. But for now, I'm going to be pointing it in this direction. And so that you can see the sort of light as it falls out over on the other side over here, I'm getting a little card so that we can actually see. Now, imagine the light is currently passing through there. It's more or less white light. And as it passes through that water, there's not much in that water to interrupt it, it on its way. It's white over on this side over here. And if our air, if our atmosphere was like this, then, um, then we wouldn't see uh, blue sky. We'd, see, we'd be able to see the, the sun. But if we had no atmosphere, it would be like being standing on the moon where uh, you'd be able to actually see the stars at the same time. Um, what we're going to be doing here is we need to stop this light. We need to refract it out in some way. And to do that, I need to put something in here that doesn't exactly dissolve in the water. We need it to suspend in the water. And so what I have for that, you can use several things. You could actually use milk. Milk is a good example of something that is a suspended solution. It, it has stuff in it that's not dissolved. It's kind of sitting in there, kind of drifting around inside it. Or in this case, I'm going to use this stuff. It's called coffee water. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Who looks at coffee and says, you know, I don't want milk, but I'd like it to be a little bit whiter. Uh, some kind of tea time part of it. Um, what we've got here, this coffee whitener doesn't dissolve either. It kind of suspends in the water. Now, what I'm going to do is add a, a few sprinkles to begin with. And as we mix it in, think about that light, that white light. Now remember, we looked at before, when we had Paul up here, we had that white light, and we got it to break up into all of those different colours. And all of those different colours, they're of what's called different wavelengths. The red ones down one end of the spectrum are kind of the underachievers of the spectrum. They're really low energy. They're very broad wavelengths. Whereas at the other end, we're dealing with higher energy. So uh, we're dealing with the violet end going into ultraviolet, which our eyes can't see. But you've heard of ultraviolet. It's the dangerous stuff coming from the sun. So highly energized, it can penetrate through your skin cells and start skin cancer. Now what we're looking for here is that as the light passes through, there's a chance for some of that light to actually hit a particle inside that water. And when it hits the particle, it starts going off in a different direction. Now, it just so happens that it's the blue end of the spectrum, that as the light passes through here, it's more likely to hit a particle and go off in a different direction, whereas the red stuff, bigger wavelengths, end up passing all the way through. So, the light coming out this end now is less white. It's slightly yellow now. You know, what would you say? Yellow? Orange? Orange. Orange? About that? If we start to add some more of this stuff, we're starting to knock out some more of that spectrum until eventually it's really only the red end of the spectrum that's going to be making its way through there. So I'm just going to go to town with the white again. <laughs> mm. 
And the light over it coming onto the car is getting darker, it's slightly redder, and it's starting to disappear. So basically the water, so the light as it passes through the water is now refracting out in all directions. It's going off in all directions. There's a chance for every part of that light to actually interact with something and go off in a different direction. So eventually all the light that's coming through over here is right down the very far end of that spectrum. Mainly lots of reds and stuff. Whereas you can see now here we've got this kind of whitish glow going around this. And if I take this light and do it in slightly different directions, so if we do it that way, you can see the white glow coming out this way. But for those people sitting directly in front of the tank, you might be able to see the filament from that direction. You can see how red it is, has become. So very red. All of the other parts of the spectrum are going off in different directions. And we end up with those really lazy photons that are red, making it wave, making its way through around uh, through to the other side because they're, they're nice large wavelengths. So there we go. Now, what has this got to do with our um, blue sky? Well, think about this. This this isn't this isn't air, this isn't the atmosphere. But there is particles in our atmosphere. So if you imagine, in our atmosphere right at the moment, imagine on a bright sunny day, you've got the sun sitting around about there. And if you looked up directly at the sun, which I don't recommend you do, if you look up directly at the sun, you've got all of that white light coming sort of straight towards you. Big high end jet. But there's also light going off in that direction over there. Light going in that direction. And as that light passes through the air, it might hit a particle up there. Particle of dust, something. And the blue parts of it, the blue ends of the spectrum down here, get refracted down towards us. So what we're seeing is, when we look up at the blue sky, is all of the light that's passing overhead from the sun to that end of the earth, all of the blue stuff is raining down on us. We look up at the sky and we see it all, there's all this blue light coming down directly, and we see it as the sky being blue. However, if you were in a different part of the Earth, if you were in a part of the Earth where the sun is starting to get close to the horizon now, so instead of being up there in the sky, it's down there, and it's got more air for it to travel through, you are now looking at the sun with all of those blue parts removed. And when we see a sunset, what colour is it? Red. Yeah, so it's reds, oranges, yellows, that sort of stuff. So all, with all of the blue parts removed, we're seeing these colours here when a sunset occurs. Uh, so all of these lazier colours we could call them. So, as the sun goes down, we start to see those red colours. When the sun, the sun is up in the air, we see the sky is blue. And there we go. That's Act 2. <laughs> uh, okay. um, Alright. So, autopsy in the microwave. Looking at blue sky. Ladies and gentlemen, once upon a time, there was a dinosaur called Ernie. He lived around about in the Trask period, he uh, went, roamed about the place, he was a um, nice long necked thing, and um, he got eaten one day by a Tyrannosaurus Rex called Susan. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, come on, naked, red, tooth and claw. Um, now, back in that time, they lived around in this great big marshy peat bog. And in this big marshy peat bog, peat bog, there was lots of decomposing vegetation. All of these trees and so on that had died. Things that uh, eventually ended up in the peat bog and started to biodegrade. And in the process of biodegrading, we ended up with uh, lots of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere being actually involved in this whole peat bog, which over time eventually got uh, covered over. And the peat bog metamorphosed over millions of years into things like coal, uh, petrochemicals, oil, thank you, very good. <laughs> so uh, digging this stuff up, we, we, we've been able to then use things like coal and oil and that sort of stuff. Now here's the thing, coal is a wonderful resource, and I'll show you why. Um, over here, I've got this thing, this is a generator. This is one of the favourite things. 
things that I have at, uh, at my home. Uh, it's a, a generator from a um, telephone company exchange. And you can see where the wires have come out, out the bottom down here. So if we put those two together like that, and if I can get a volunteer to put their tongue on that, <laughs> no, yeah, really, it's okay. uh, If we open this up, what I have is a whole bunch of magnets inside there. A whole bunch of magnets, and inside it, if we pull this thing apart, there'll be a bunch of wires. At the side here, we've got a great big handle. So if I turn this handle, we can actually get electricity being generated, and we can get a spark coming out of this thing. This thing generates electricity by turning this around. But if you think about it, what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing this thing. I'm having to put the energy into turning this thing to make the electricity. So let's think about the coal. We dig up the coal. We have a nice block of coal, which is a wonderful bit of energy. It's packed chemical energy. We set fire to it. What comes out of it? Energy. Yeah, energy. But what sort of energy? It starts with an H, ends in heat. Yeah, very good. So, we get heat. We get huge amounts of heat coming out of it. You put it down there. You put some water over the top of it. As the water starts to boil, the boiling water starts to move. And as it moves, we get lots of uh, uh, hot, boiling... Um, uh, sorry, we get lots of steam coming out of it as well too. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's come back to this thing. Think about this. To make electricity, I need to turn this thing around here. Well, I have got a whole bunch of lights currently pointing on me at the moment. And these lights need to be powered by electricity. So let's do a little thought experiment. Let's follow these lights. Let's follow the wires out of them. We follow them into the street. And when we get into the street, we follow a whole bunch of power lines. They go off in that direction. We go off in that direction, uh, a couple of hundred kilometers. You eventually get to a valley, and in this valley, there's a whole heap of buildings. And in this whole heap of buildings, there is a great big room. And in the middle of one of these rooms, there is hundreds of these things and lots of people standing around like this. <laughs> going, weird. I really wish I did better at school. No, uh, Now, we don't have hundreds of these things, but they certainly do have these things. The generators there are huge. They're the size of this room, and at one end they have a turbine. And at that turbine, this is where this hot, hot steam is now pushing past to turn these things around. So currently, right now, these lights are on because there is a turbine. Right now, this very moment, spinning, there is coal currently, right now, uh, burning uh, because uh, to give us the electricity that's in this room. All right. So, there's the electricity in our room. Let's think about that coal. So, a couple of million years ago, this peat bog was uh, absorbing a whole heap of carbon dioxide and we've stuck it and we've had it underground for quite some time. Now, about 200 years ago, uh, a, a man figured out something called the carbon cycle. It goes a little bit like this. Um, there's a lot of things on the Earth which absorbs carbon dioxide. So we have carbon dioxide going from the atmosphere, a little bit like this. Being pulled out of the atmosphere and being absorbed by something. So whether it be like when a tree grows, it absorbs some of that carbon dioxide. Uh, when, sorry, what was that? that? Yeah, trees, plants, all of that sort of stuff. It absorbs carbon dioxide. But then we also have a release as well too. So going off in this direction. Things like, for instance, yeah, if we exhale, every time we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide. So there is this uh, um, cycle which is going around and around. Now, there's a couple of natural rhythms to the cycle out there in the real world. Like, for instance, the ocean exhales a huge amount of carbon dioxide every day, more than a lot of, uh, uh, more than a lot of our industries put together is putting this carbon dioxide out into the, um, to the air. But at the same time, the oceans are also absorbing a whole heap of this carbon dioxide. So there's a bit of a natural rhythm going on there. There's also a natural rhythm in things like a natural stuff that happens on the earth. Say, a forest fire happens. When a forest fire happens, all of a sudden all this carbon dioxide gets released into the air. But then the forest grows back. And when the forest grows back, <laughs> over time, this carbon dioxide then gets reabsorbed. Back and around and around and around. Now, carbon dioxide, it's, um, it's kind of fun stuff as well, too. What I have here is some carbon dioxide. 
inside this tub, I've got some carbon dioxide, not as gas, but uh, carbon dioxide that is as a solid. It's dry ice. Um, dry ice, carbon dioxide as a solid, needs to be incredibly cold. We're looking at minus 70 or so degrees Celsius, so it is very, very cold in uh, So cold, in fact, I'm just going to, because uh, I like my fingers, and so I like my eyes exactly where they are as well, too. So, here it is. This stuff here. I meant to do that. This stuff here is so cold, but it's a solid right at the moment, but it's currently what's called sublimating. It's going straight from a solid to a gas. So it doesn't have any kind of liquid in between. So if you imagine ice, you melt ice, um, ice becomes wa liquid water, liquid water you can then turn into uh, steam. But this stuff here goes straight from carbon dioxide solid to carbon dioxide as a gas. But it's also very cold. Oh. What we're seeing here, those clouds, isn't carbon dioxide. What we've got is all of the water vapour on my breath oh. is starting to turn back into little droplets. So I've got all that stuff there. Which means we can also do a few other little fun things with it as well, too. Like, um, for instance, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> what we have here is uh, the carbon dioxide going from its um, solid state straight into a gas state um, in this nice water that's sitting in it. So we've got lots of clouds coming off this thing here because uh, of all the water moisture that's kind of sitting around it. We end up with these lovely clouds. But it's also kind of percolating and bubbling away there. So we can um, add a little bit of this to it. Uh, the, the thing is, 
we are now pulling out a whole heap of stuff out of the ground, which um, uh, uh, the, the guy who discovered this, the guy who discovered the cycle, also discovered something else, which was known as the greenhouse effect. Um, this has been known for over 200 years. Uh, the idea being that light from the sun made it through the atmosphere, um, and nothing happens. You see, uh, carbon dioxide is up there in, in the atmosphere with a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, to show you exactly what, what we've got in there, imagine we get a whole bunch of the atmosphere and um, we, we stick it onto this car. And um, we move it around a bit so that we can break it up into various components. So it would look a little bit like this. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> I really did just mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. But it's only around, um, you know, 21% or thereabouts. Nitrogen. There's quite a lot of nitrogen. It's about 78%. So there's huge amounts of nitrogen. And nitrogen has its own cycle as well, too. A little bit like carbon dioxide cycle. Over here, this little dot. This is everything else. <laughs> this is, um, you know, any of your trace gases, your, your heliums and that sort of stuff, but it's also carbon dioxide. There is a small amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Not very much compared to, say, oxygen and nitrogen. And this is where, like, for instance, when we had the, uh, the, the people on, on the uh, lawns of uh, Parliament House yesterday uh, talking about, oh, carbon dioxide, it's not too bad. It's a trace gas. It's hardly any of it there. But you see, here's the thing. That's oxygen, O2. And that's nitrogen, N2. Carbon dioxide, CO2. We have got a carbon atom, and we've got two oxygen atoms on either side. It does something that these guys don't really do. The nitrogen and the oxygen are just two atoms sitting next to each other like that. Whereas the carbon dioxide have this amazing ability to kind of oscillate back and forth like that. Got the carbon sitting in the middle and the oxygen sitting around the outside. So if something hits it, a nice big energetic particle, remember our, our microwave. Our microwave heats up water by having energetic microwave waves going through and hitting the water and having it move around. The same sort of thing happens with the carbon dioxide, except in this case it's infrared. Infrared radiation hits it and it starts to oscillate backwards and forwards like this. It's able to absorb this heat as this kind of kinetic energy. And as it oscillates around the place, it can also bump into other things and get them startling as, as well too. So um, what we end up with is this guy discovered the greenhouse effect because he noticed that light would pass through the atmosphere in one direction or hit the earth and then go back in the other direction out to space. But on its way, it would bump into carbon dioxide, effectively trapping the heat in the Earth's atmosphere. And it doesn't take much for it to actually happen. But here's the other thing too. We have a natural carbon dioxide cycle, like we said. You know, things burn down, things grow back. But we're also pulling out of the ground a whole heap of carbon dioxide from millions of years ago. And we're setting it on fire. And this carbon dioxide is ending up in the atmosphere as well too. So, it is ending up in the atmosphere, but what we're doing is this part of the cycle and not this part. We don't have it coming back down. It's not being reabsorbed, re sequestrated back into some form. It's going out there and it's increasing the amount that's already out there. Um, okay, is it a worry? Well, yeah, kind of is. Um, there is really. <laughs> Actually, give him a round of uh, It is a problem. Uh, also, among other things, not, not, not least of which, is because a lot of people are actually sort of uh, uh, willfully, uh, willfully 
ignoring the science, which is going into actually finding out if this stuff is actually going on. Uh, so, in terms of what we know about, is it going on? Yes, yes it is. Uh, should we do something about it? Yeah, yeah, we should. So, um, but to be honest, uh, in terms of an explanation, I, I would know a lot of people would look at that and pull it to pieces. If Andrew Bolt was in the audience, and I did send him an invitation, he would have a lot of things to say about that. Um, but this brings us to a bit of a crux and a thing that I want to uh, share with you for this night of, of Rough Science, is that it really isn't about me being up here on stage trying to tell you guys something, something that most of you by and large perhaps may already know. It is about everybody having a conversation about this stuff. No matter what you might know, go ahead and, and try something out and do it and pull it apart and, and talk about it with people around you. Otherwise, we are going to end up with only the Andrew Bolts having their opinion out there. So with that in mind, I want to take us back to just one uh, last thing, which is my group. Um, I want to show you the most spectacular thing that I can possibly do with this group. Basically because, because a lot of people feel that science is something to do with explosions. But I'm going to show you, it doesn't have to be. We're going to go through tonight without a proper big flaming explosion. We're going to try and do something nice and spectacular with this brew. And for this, it's something that I like to call the pizza tray of doom. Now, for those people who have seen it before, which I'm pretty sure you guys have. Uh, once. Yes, once. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what, uh, look, I implore everybody here to try this out for themselves. And for this, you will need one brew. You will also need uh, something for it to sort of sit up uh, the rest of the equipment on. And the rest of the equipment is one glass of water. Like this. Uh, also, one pizza tray. Now in this case I've just got a, uh, some sort of baking tray, that'll do as well too. And uh, the final thing that you need is uh, some kind of hapless victim to sit on top of that there. And the hapless victim in this case is an egg. Um, to sit him up there so he's nice and comfortable, I've got a little box of matches here. So we're going to flatten that box of matches out a little bit like this and have it sitting up on top like that. We're going to sit the egg into the middle of it a little bit like this. And most important, we're going to make sure it's lined up. So, uh, yeah, a little bit more to the left. Yeah, good, good, good. Around about there or so. Good. Put that around about there. And uh, just make sure here. Now, the challenge here is that we need to try to somehow remove the tray so that the egg is completely undisturbed. And the egg will gracefully fall down into the glass of water. Impossible, I hear you say. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a great audience. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Alright, so for this, you do need to have one broom. You also need to have a broom that you can um, sort of make into a bit of a lever, a little bit like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to put this thing around about here. And put our foot on it around about here. This. I need to count it, beginning from three. Three, two, one. one. So, you ready? One. So, all together now. Three, three two, two, one. Right. <laughs> and put it up there and wave it around. Can I borrow you for a second? Give her a round of applause. Thank you. I'll try not to kick your glasses on the way up, of course. Uh, and just come up this way over to the, uh, the stage stairs just over here. And, um, and come into the line just over here. Hello, what's your name? Miff. Hello, Miff. Welcome. Um, have we met before? Uh, no, no, we haven't. Good. Uh, because basically, 
we missed. Uh, tonight has been all about uh, you know sort of you guys doing it yourself. So we're going to do the final demonstration. Smith's oh. going to do it. <laughs> what I'd like you to do here: Have you ever done the pizza tray of doom yourself? No. So this is all the first time. I have to admit, I've never done it on this chair, so I don't know how well this is going to go. <laughs> okay. Miff, what we need to do is, like you saw me before, you're going to be standing with one foot on the end of the, uh, the, the broom here, like this. You're going to hold this thing back here, and you're just simply going to let go of it, like that. Okay? So you got it with that? So what I'll get you to do is have a little practice of it right now. So sit that down, put your foot on top of it, bend it back a little bit, and let go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay. Good. Okay, Miff, come a little closer over here. Um, now, do not let it go until we give you the absolute OK go signal here, okay? Because this could be really disastrous. <laughs> Let's make sure we're lined up. We've got this one here. We've got that one there. We've got to put that around about there. I've got a boat of confidence for you in the front row right down there. <laughs> and, okay, the important thing here is not to have it quite as hard as what you had just there. So, <laughs> what we'll do is we'll put it here. If you'd like to come and stand here, and let's step through. So let's put that there. If you'd like to put your foot on top. And what you're going to do is going to let the edge of the seat here, let the edge of the chair take the, uh, the, the full force of this. We've got that kind of sitting out there kind of nicely about it. That's good. Okay, so do you feel confident? Hey, <laughs> for the rest of you, no. what we need is a countdown from three. So three, three two, two, one, one. and if she gets it, go nuts. <laughs> I, okay, so when they get to one, I want you to let go of the top of the broom like that. You got that? No problem. All good? Okay, here we go. And three, three two, two, one, one. one. go. something with a rough picture that goes with it. If you haven't already checked it out, go onto my website and have a little look at it. But I'm also doing this tonight as a bit of an experiment myself. Between things like trying to use Twitter in the audience here, between you guys allowing you to take photographs and that sort of stuff. Uh, but um, uh, we'd, we'd love to try this experiment out again. So guys, what I'm going to do is, at this point, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to hand it all back to you guys, but out there, there are some survey forms. And I'd love for you to be able to uh, uh, fill those survey forms out. Uh, fall at the back and be able to uh, sort that out for you. Uh, but for the rest of you, it was going to be a lot more smooth because my jacket is in my For the rest of you, this has been an evening of rough science. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we've sort of gone through here and looked at, and all the stuff, even the carbon dioxide over there, you guys can try this out at home. Be sure and check out the website and you can find out all about it. But otherwise, um, come and join me for a drink backstage. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here, and I uh, hope you have a good night. Thank you. Yeah.